those around you, if you would, please. Oh, maybe I'll see for a minute. Good morning. Um, oh, I, like, I didn't see you go downstairs, but apparently you did have a seat. Okay. Well, good morning. We're glad you could be here to worship with us this morning. We are excited about a few things that are going on at church here. We have uh, the first thing is uh, Butch's class has started, and so um, the foundations class is meeting in room number seven. More information is in your bulletin there, but really want to encourage you to stick around for Sunday school. I know that. It's an extra hour of your day, but it's definitely worth the time to invest, to know God's word, to discuss those things, and then also to keep your children here. We have plenty of uh, godly stuff for them as well for Sunday school. Uh, A couple other things too as well. No council meeting uh, this Sunday. We'll postpone that uh, to a later date. And then also night of worship. Uh, Just want you to take note of that. That's happening, and I don't know... Did you want to say anything? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, she made the announcements last week. All right. Did you want to say anything further for the night of worship? I'm going to put you right on the spot as you come in. She has a baby, so she has an excuse to come in late. All right? <laughs> We're excusing the absence. All right. Come. Join us. Night of worship, February 26th at 7 to 8 p.m. All ages are welcome be a great night of just fellowship and praising the Lord together. We really like to uh, invite you to do that. Also, guess who's coming to dinner? Maybe that's a reminder for you next week. Uh, And I think that takes care of the announcement part. This Wednesday, I announced to the students that I've taken a position as as a senior pastor at uh, uh, Cornerstone Fellowship Church in uh, Greenfield, Iowa. And... um, We are excited to be able to uh, pursue uh, the senior pastor role and take on the position. I think for me and Michelle, we are sad to be leaving. May will mark 15 years of being here at Faith Church. And so we have enjoyed our time here. We have enjoyed our experiences together. Um, One of my former students was asking, uh, who's your favorite a couple of weeks ago they were asking who's your favorite youth group or whatever and I said you know every cycle uh, that comes and goes and as students have graduated and of course have moved on you know new students have come up and even this year we have great students as well and so I said I know it's a cop-out answer but it's just it's not really a, a fair one to answer because at the end of the day all of them have been great and we've enjoyed our time here and and the mission trips that we've been able to take with the students and the retreats and the different things that we've done to uh, the experiences here at church of um, really one of the things as I was uh, going through the the candidacy of of senior pastor and they asked me well what you know how do you why do you qualify you know what what makes you you know ready for the position and and I said well I have a lot to learn but I said one of the great things that uh you know, uh, my senior pastor has done is prepare me for uh, the next role by allowing me to preach, to be involved in adult ministry, to do different things throughout the church. Uh, I jokingly said my title here was anything the senior pastor didn't want to do. <laughs> and they all giggled as well. So, but, uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed my time here at church. And so uh, a couple questions I'm sure you have is when I'm leaving. I told Butch Monday morning, but no, that's not true. But uh, uh, it'll be a couple months. We're going to processing. You can pray for us as a family. Uh, first of all, just we're, we, I talked about some damage to my house in August, and it's not fixed yet due to uh, some lousy construction uh, crew. But anyway, it's getting work done right now, and so you can pray for us as we get that done. And then um, you can pray, uh, if you would, for our family. As we told Maverick and explained things, his biggest, uh, you know, sadness and 
uh, really upset was his friends. He loves the church friends that he has and, and the school friends. And so we were excited when we went down to candidate that they did a great job and uh, making him uh, new friends, new new boys at his age. There's uh, quite a few, and so uh, that was nice. Can't replace the boys here, but uh, it was just good for him to connect with somebody. And then Maverick, of course, would be all smiles anywhere he goes, so it doesn't matter if he's here or in Iowa or, or you know, southern Iowa or whatever. But um, And then, yeah, pray for me and my wife as we navigate. Pray for the emotions of leaving and the wisdom of leaving and... Uh, we, again, have just really enjoyed every, every season of the ministry that we've had here, and so we'll be sad to go. And I think Andrew has a couple things as well uh, to pray for for us, but you can be praying for the next, next process for us, and I'll have Andrew come up here and finish it off. Yeah, when I left my youth ministry job, the... We had just recently hired a new secretary for the church, and, and I'm telling you, she was there for maybe like three weeks, and yet she was there standing at the door saying, okay, you got to turn in your keys. I thought, what? Don't let the door hit you on your way out. So, so anyway, same to you. <laughs> Except I'll be the one asking for the keys. No, we, um, we haven't planned yet, but we're, we're talking about uh, having a little send-off for... Mike and Michelle when they finally do leave and um, and I know that it's been great to have Norby be a part of our our church family for so long and it's rare that a youth pastor stays for this long in a church but we're excited for him and for the opportunity that is next and that also presents us with new opportunities as well and so I want you to know that this does not come as a surprise this morning, like, how come you never told us? <laughs> you know, we, we've known for a while that this has been in the works, and so already our elders of our church, we've been meeting already the last couple of weeks talking about what's next and, and how we're going to fill the role, and so those discussions have been ongoing, and so just rest assured that we are we are praying as church leaders about how to take the next steps and, and exactly the whole process and everything else. And so I would ask that you be in prayer for us as well, for really our, our whole church. This is a, just moving forward is, is a big step. And so I'd ask for your prayer as you think about us and, and certainly pray for Norby, Michelle, and the family. And... Um, Exciting times for them and um, opportunities for us as well. So I would invite um, our ushers to come forward to take our morning offering, and I'm just going to have a word of prayer for us and also for the Norby family. Father God, we come before you. We do thank you for blessing upon blessing that you give to us. Sometimes these blessings we don't always recognize at first, but God, we know that you give and you take care of your faithful followers. And so even now... We do pray for this offering. We pray for this service that we have before us. We pray for um, even our future as um, Faith Evangelical Church. We pray for Norby and his future at Cornerstone Church of Greenfield. God, we just ask that you continue to lead, guide, and direct. And even as we, even as we part ways, God, we're just thankful for the years of service and the ministry and lives that have been impacted and touched because of your faithful servants. And so, God, we just thank you for this day, and we just pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him, what a mighty God we He is my light, my strength, my song. 
So I know at church we're all supposed to encourage one another, and I want to encourage every man in this church to realize that uh, two days from now is Tuesday, and you better think about it. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for salvation in you. We need you, Lord, and we thank you for what you do. Lord, we lift up Sally Holacek unto you right now. She is having surgery tomorrow, and we pray that you would give those doctors wisdom and you would bring healing to her body that they can remove that tumor. Lord, you are the ultimate healer. Just watch over that and be with Lynn and their family. Take care of that, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray for Dave Butler that you'll continue to help him as he's recovering from his stroke, that he does his physical therapy, that um, he can become strong and we can see him back here at church. We praise you for him as well and take care of him. Lord, we do pray for um, Michelle and Norby that you will bless them as, uh, as he, they go to Greenfield as the new head pastor and uh, um, watch over them, take care of their family. Um, we praise you for Norby. We praise you for Michelle and their family. Um, we love them and are grateful for them. We pray for um, the future here as well that you would bring us um, the man of God to fill that position that you would want. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Oh, we want to rejoice and be grateful in you. Bless Andrew as he speaks from your word. We thank you. Amen.
one final announcement for this morning is I am offering a, a new members class starting today that meets in my office during Sunday school time. So even if you're sort of on the fence about whether or not you want to join, I'd encourage you to come on over to my office after fellowship time and, and just uh, we'll chat. It'll be um, throughout the month of February that we'll be meeting. So if that is of interest to you, I would encourage you to stick around for that. Our chapter that we're going to talk about this morning reveals a fun and favorite and familiar story to many of you. And even though it is wild and is remarkable what takes place, I would remind you, even before we dig in, that we're talking about history. We are talking about an event that actually happened. Even though it is miraculous, it is not a fairy tale. It is simply God at work in the world. This morning we will read the account of three Hebrew men who refused to compromise their faith. Up until this chapter, these three, known as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, known to you and to many people as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, up until this time, they've only been kind of on the, on the peripherals of the story. But this week, in chapter 3, they take center stage. In fact, I don't even know if Daniel's name is mentioned here in chapter 3, but it's all about these three men and how they chose to honor God, how they chose to not compromise their faith. What they did, of course, is they stood up in faith in front of a very angry, sort of unhinged king, and they declared that they will worship none other than the God of heaven. Again, we're going to read this morning about a vain and temperamental king. We are going to read of three young men who chose not to dishonor their God, who were steadfast in their commitment, and who chose faith over fear. For our sermon this morning, I struggled a bit to come up with our main thought. To read through Daniel chapter 3 is to read so many different themes. There's so many different directions that we could go. Certainly, we could talk about resolve, which seems to be a major theme throughout the entire book of Daniel. We could talk about how don't let the crowd sway what you do and how you live. And certainly we'll talk about what it looks like to honor God. But, but at the very heart of this passage is the concept of worship. Now you might think, well, where is that found? Eleven different times in this chapter the word worship is used. And so that's what brings us to our main thought for this morning, is this, it comes down to this, who or what will you worship in life? What is the object of your worship? Is it our God above, or is, is it something that is here, that's man-made on this earth, or is it even your own self? You've placed yourself on the throne instead of placing God. It's interesting to note that as I read chapter 3, and as most of you know the story of these three Hebrew men, all of us want to identify with them. All of us kind of want to slide right in and think, I'm just like these three, and for me, I would stand up for my faith, even if it means death. But I want you to know this morning that I think probably most of us could actually identify with Nebuchadnezzar more than these three Hebrew boys. Why do I say that? I say that simply because, truth be told, we are the ones who love praise and who love acclaim and who love attention and recognition from others. We are the ones who struggle with pride and vanity. And so again, the question is, are we really willing to bring all of our worship and direct it heavenward? Or are there things in our lives where 
we say, well, well hold on. I, I kind of like being on the throne of my life. And I kind of like living for me and worshiping what I want to worship instead of worshiping God. And so I believe this passage is going to hit us right there. This passage is going to open up our eyes to what worship looks like and how God always ought to have that place of priority and preeminence in our lives. What I'd like to do this morning is invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. And the way that I've done this the last couple of weeks, we're going to follow this same pattern. As, as I talk of the flow of the narrative, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that section, we'll talk about it, and then I'll read the next verses, and we'll talk about that and kind of work our way through so we get the whole flow of what is going on here in these 30 verses of Daniel chapter 3. Some of you, of course, chuckle because you think usually it takes me months and months and months to do 30 verses. Fasten those seat belts because we're moving. First of all, I want to talk about the requirement from this pagan king, the requirement that Nebuchadnezzar puts upon not only the Hebrews, but all the people in his realm. And let's look there, Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I challenge you even as I read to take note of each time the word worship is used right here. Here it goes, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. I'm just going to pause right there because most people don't know what a cubit is. In Jewish reckoning, a cubit is 18 inches. In Babylonian uh, reckoning, which is a little bit different, they say that a cubit is 20 inches. So we're talking about a structure that is between 90 and 100 feet tall by 9 to 10 feet as a base. Very tall object right there, set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse 2, King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials in the province to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You see the emphasis there. All these people on the image that a man had set up. Certainly he was the king of a great empire, but Nebuchadnezzar had set up this image, obviously for a very specific purpose. Takes us to verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So... <clears throat> so at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So we read that there is a requirement from this pagan king. He set up an image, a giant image that is made of gold. It is exceedingly tall and it is exceedingly impressive. I'm not exactly sure what this image looked like. Of course, there's with everything, it seems there's two schools of thought. 
There's some people who think that it was a giant obelisk, much like the Washington Monument. Again, just speculation, and I think we've got a picture of that somewhere in here. So some think that, that, that this image that he set up looked just like that. But then there's others, and this is where I'm kind of inclined to be, is that I think what he set up is probably an image of a man, presumably taking note of this vision and dream that he had in back in chapter 2 of this, of this giant image with the head of gold and then the different metals that go on. If you remember from back in our discussion last week, that image and what it represented was simply the fact that someday the Babylonian Empire would come to a close and then there'd be another empire and another and another. And so here as we enter chapter 3, we've got Nebuchadnezzar and I sense that he is saying, you know what, that image that represented me only had the head of gold but I want to prolong my own legacy, so I am going to make an image entirely of gold to make it seem like my kingdom, my empire, will go on forever and ever and ever. And so, again, Daniel chapter 2, you see the four different materials. And here in Daniel chapter 3, it is all gold right there. And so, of course, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted everyone to bow down and worship. And quite frankly, that, that's the thrust of these verses right here. It doesn't matter if it's an obelisk or an image of the king himself. Regardless of all of that, what we have before us is a pagan king demanding to be worshipped. A pagan king who demands it, but know this, that we have a God in heaven who not only demands it, but who also deserves it. With King Nebuchadnezzar, this is an undeserving man. Certainly, he was king over a vast empire. Certainly, he was impressive in his war, in his intellect, and all sorts of other things. But listen, what we have before us is a king who is not worthy of worship. Instead, we have got a God above who deserves to be worshipped. So he makes a requirement. Again, by the way, this this king should have remembered a couple things. Nebuchadnezzar should have remembered that certainly his kingdom would come to an end. Nebuchadnezzar should have remembered that when Daniel interpreted the dream, Daniel said, this will happen. This is what God has said, and this is what will be. And certainly he should have remembered also that there was a God in heaven who places kings and certainly emperors as well. And so the command is to worship this image, really a worship of the pagan king. And for anyone who failed to do that, there was no judge, there was no jury, only straight off to execution. And so then we read in verse 8 and following, we're going to read something else. Let's follow along as I read these verses. Because not only has the command gone out, but already people were falling down and worshiping this image. Verse 8, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Now, this is kind of interesting that the ones who are ratting out the Jewish people are these Chaldeans who right back in chapter 2, their lives were spared because of Daniel and the other Hebrew men. So their lives had been spared, but yet here they are trying to curry favor with the king. And so they right here are saying, you know, king, everybody's bowing down except for these three guys. Here's what they say. They came forward to accuse the Jews. Verse 9, they spoke and said to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. This endless schmoozing that's always going on with this guy. O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery 
furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due, res- due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, and of course I love this, the sky is wild here. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true? I want to pause here to say this is kind of interesting because usually when this guy flies into a rage, he just acts. He doesn't always think. But here he's actually giving these guys a chance. And so he's asking them a question and even giving them a chance to repeat and do things the right way. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time that you hear the, that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony, symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And I love the last part of verse 15. Please don't tune out. Listen to this. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? When Nebuchadnezzar is saying right there, yes, he's asking a question. Quite frankly, it's pretty rhetorical what he's saying. He's basically saying this. There is no one. There is no one in heaven above who could ever save you. If you defy me, here's what's going to happen to you. You will burn. And you're going to burn real soon. Because there's no one. There's no one who could possibly deliver you from me. Listen to the response. I love what these guys say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, verse 18, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your God, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I read this, and even if we were to stop right here, I stand in awe of these young men. Talk about gutsy to stand before the king knowing that right then and right there he can haul you off and have you burned immediately. And so what we see is we see this word resolve that I continue to use, the resolve of these Hebrew young men. By the way, often we think about these guys as mere boys. The narrative, the story that takes place here in chapter 3 is anywhere from 16 to 20 years after the events of chapter 2. So no longer are we talking teenage boys right here. Right now these guys are probably in their young to mid-30s. And so keep that in mind as we roll through this because, and I know Google is really not my best source as always, but you see different people who draw pictures of what this might look like and you've got these tiny, skinny, small little boys who are in the midst of this furnace. But, but really these guys are in their 30s. And so we know that from different other extra-biblical sources. One is called the Septuagint. It's the Greek writing of the Old Testament, and that actually gives dates behind all of this. So it was just a little nerdy history stuff that I love, and you can grab hold of. Anyway, as we talk about point two, obviously, 
obviously worshiping anything other than God was aberrant to these young Jewish men and any God-fearing people. They would look at this and they say, absolutely not. This is a terrible thing, a terrible thing for a pagan king to ask. So clearly these men said no. They did not obey the king. And, and what's interesting to me is this seems to have gone unnoticed by most other people. And again, I think the whole scene here, and, and it, again, it is repeated and repeated again. You've got this, uh, you know, the Babylonian orchestra, and the, you got all these people playing instruments. You got the crowds who are gathered around on this great plain, and evidently the king comes up behind some podium, and then his herald kind of blows a trumpet and makes this announcement of what needs to happen. So the king is there. It's all sorts of pomp and circumstance. And at that point in time, what needs to happen is these Jewish people are supposed to bow down to the king's command. And they stood up there, looks like right in front of everyone else, and they said no. And yet most people don't recognize, except these Chaldeans, they notice, and they start think, thinking, hey, wait a second, we've got these Jewish guys over there, these guys who've been promoted and promoted and promoted again all the way along, and these guys are not bowing down. Again, it kind of becomes, it's kind of unnoticed by most people, but, but these guys notice, and so they make sure to talk to the king. And I think, we don't know the exact setting of this, but I think it's all happening right there on stage front and center in front of all of these people. As you read through, I used to think that, well, probably at a later date, these guys came and made mention to the king. But, but later on, we, we see that looks like this orchestra is still there. Looks like everybody is ready, and, and they're all ready to do this all over again. So I think this whole narrative unfolds in front of all of the crowds. So again, even more courageous for these young men to stand up. And they said, no. Now often the question is, well, okay, so why did these Chaldeans, why did they want to rid the earth? Why would they tell the king about these three Hebrew guys? And I think the, the bottom line is, I think it's just jealousy. I think it's jealousy all the way along. These guys have been promoted. The Chaldeans were kind of second rate. And so they kind of faded out. And these other guys were... Um, sort of front and center. Uh, another question that's often asked is, uh, maybe you're thinking this right now, where's Daniel? How come we don't read about Daniel in these verses? Didn't Daniel stand up for what is right? And there's usually uh, four main ideas of why Daniel is not mentioned. And one is that maybe Daniel bowed down and worshiped the, the false image. And, and, and I don't believe that for a second because we see Daniel's character all the way through, and he is always honoring to God. So I do not believe that Daniel bowed down to this golden image. Uh, other speculations, some people think that maybe Daniel is somehow exempt from this because he is such a high-ranking official, but I don't read that in the text either. It sounds like everybody who is anybody has been gathered there, so I sort of reject that interpretation also. Uh, a third idea that some people have posited is that maybe because Daniel, in his interpretation of the dream of chapter 2, spared the life of these Chaldeans, maybe they did have this warm spot in their heart for Daniel, and so they told on the other three guys but didn't tell about Daniel bowing down also. But I don't think that's true either. We, we would surmise that probably... Daniel, as a high-ranking guy, is off doing the king's business elsewhere, and he just wasn't present at that time. Or else I firmly believe that Daniel would be doing everything that these other young men were doing. And so, as we flow with our story, the king gives these guys a chance, a second chance, which is kind of unheard of, especially for this angry king. He gives them a second chance, and he said, all right, let, let's do this again. Are you willing to bow down? And he's ready to cue the musicians all over again. And he says, if you do this, good. But if you do not worship the image, you'll be cast immediately into this fire. I love 
the response. I love this. I could read this over and over and over again, what these guys say in verses 17 and 18. It is profound and it is powerful, and we can grab hold of that for anything that we face today. It's got those sort of implications. The resolve of these three guys makes it very clear where their commitments lie. They are unwaveringly committed to following and obeying God. And here's what they say. They say, first of all, verse 17, that the God of heaven, the God of Israel, their God is fully capable of delivering them. They said, we, our God, the one that we serve, is fully capable. He is able to save us. And then they said, last part of 17 is that they say, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. So there's confidence moving forward of what God would do. But then verse 18, but even if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And so one thing is certain, they will not bow down. Moving forward, 19, verse 19, please follow along. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the fiery, burning furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So, what we read right here is the wrath of the king. This angry man. We can almost see like the redness and the fury of his face. His face changed. The expression on his face was drastically altered. He was filled with fury. So much so that he acted a little bit irrationally. Like if he wanted these guys to suffer, you'd probably want to cool down the furnace seven times instead of heat it up seven times. It was so hot that even the guys who, who threw them in, they were immediately singed and they died. So, I, I don't, here we got some artist rendering of what this might have looked like. Some people think that this was probably a brick kiln where they would make the the foundation, or maybe it was for smelting of gold, but there was an existing furnace that was stoked hot as always. And so some think that they would walk up through the top and pitch them over, but then also down below there was an area where you could feed the fire and you could see different things because somehow the king is at a vantage point to actually see them while they are in the fire. There's another picture that we've got. This is uh, from some architectural ruins that were found, or archaeological ruins that were found, and this is a, a brick kiln as well. And you see the great opening there, and there's some sheep hiding in there. I don't know if you can see that, but anyway, so that's the place that presumably, if this were like the one that was there in Babylon, that the king could see into the fire and see what was going on right there. And so... They're thrown in, even in all of their nice clothes, they are pitched into this burning, fiery furnace. I don't know about you, but being burned alive does not sound terribly appealing. It sounds painful, and yet these men, they 
were resolved to follow after God. So point number three, we've got rage and we've got wrath of the king. By the way, I went just way out of my way this week to make sure I alliterated for all of you in these first five points. So we've got all our words. So just uh, take note when it comes time for salary increases, things like that. I alliterated. So anyway, let's look at uh, verse 24 and following. By the way, thank you, Kathy Bolton, for laughing. I appreciate it. <laughs> so verse 24 it says this. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and he spoke, saying this to his counselors. Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, That is true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Okay, a couple of things. We threw these guys in, three of them, and they were bound. But now hold on. Now I'm looking, and there are four, and they're walking around, presumably unbound. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, went near the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace, and he spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, now, isn't this interesting? Nebuchadnezzar, who wanted all the acclaim and all the attention in all of his arrogance and pride and vanity and all the other words that are associated with this guy, and here he is saying, making a very clear distinction, you three men are servants of the Most High God. Again, there's a testimony here. These men already were living out their faith to such a degree. So he says, you, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men, now get this, on whose bodies the fire had no power, the hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. This is a grade A miracle right here. What we see is the very hand of God protecting these men. I call this a divine rescue. God was not content to let his servants burn. And so God clearly is rescuing these guys. Um, th this fire was so hot, as we read earlier, that, that even some of the king's men were, um, were burned as they were throwing these three Hebrew men into the fire. Um, there's another picture here. This is just an artist rendering. This was not like Scott Irvin taking a picture for the newspaper, but this is We've got a three men, and they've got an image of this fourth. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, who really doesn't know much about the God of Israel, makes this statement in verse 20, um, 25. He says, The form of the fourth is like the Son of God, or like a Son of the gods. What we have right here is this fourth person is angelic in appearance. It was startling enough to know that, that Nebuchadnezzar was very clear that this fourth person was not like the other three at all. Again, Oz, the question that comes up is, who is the fourth? Some people say, well, it was obviously Jesus based on the picture that we just saw. Okay, that picture doesn't count. It's just an idea. Some people think that it's a pre-incarnate form of Jesus that came to this earth and protected and communed with these three men who chose to worship God. Others think it was probably an angel that came. Um, the angel Gabriel is mentioned a couple times in Daniel. Maybe it was the angel Gabriel. Bottom line is we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us who was there. Either Jesus or an angel seems most likely. But here Nebuchadnezzar sees and of course he questions, 
And, and furthermore, he's probably thankful that this fourth did not come out of the fire too. But again, remarkable, remarkably what, remarkable what God does. We would expect these guys to come out with minor burns or something. They didn't even smell like smoke. God's deliverance was so complete. God's deliverance was so over the top, amazing what our God can do. Let's listen to the response of the king. This is our fifth R, and it's found here in verse 28 through 30. The response from the king. Here's what he says. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and have yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. This is one thing we always learn about these Old Testament kings. They're always making these decrees pretty quickly and rashly. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made into an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Verse 29, there is no other God who can do this. There is none other. And you've got a pagan king recognizing the ability of God. Now, now Nebuchadnezzar here doesn't say everyone must worship, but what he's doing is he's putting a layer of protection around these other Hebrews saying, listen, don't say anything against their God because I have seen with my own eyes what their God can do. And so he is, his eyes continue to get open more and more and more. No other God can deliver like this just like to remind you this morning that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Hebrews, is the same God that we worship today. And I want you to know this, that there's no other. There's no other on this world, or on this earth, or in this world, who can deliver like our God. And I'd remind you that whatever the obstacles that you face in your life, whatever the frustrations, whatever the temptations, our God is able to rise above all of that and our God is able to deliver in very real and very miraculous ways. There is nothing that is too far gone or too far outside of his reach. And so I would urge you and encourage you to look up and worship our God. Conclusion, some Lessons for us to take home from our passage this morning. First of all, I want to challenge you to learn from your past. We ought to learn from our past. There are lessons to be learned. King Nebuchadnezzar should have learned a whole bunch of lessons from chapter 2, and he didn't. He should have learned that his rule would someday come to an end. He should have learned that God is the ruler above all. He also should have learned that the Hebrews kind of had an inside track to God. But, but they didn't learn. And my point is, for all of us, God takes us through life step by step and day by day. And God gives us experiences to teach us how to walk with him, to teach us that, that, that he alone can deliver. And God shows up again and again and again. And God shows off again and again and again in our lives and through our lives. And so I want to challenge all of you, don't just live in frustration for today and dread tomorrow, but also look back and see what God has already done for you. Because the same God who has already walked with you through difficult times will continue to walk with you throughout everything in the future as well. So learn from our past, namely that God is still on the throne and God still wants to walk with us. Second thing I want to challenge you to learn from our passage this morning 
is this, that worshiping God ought to be our prime, not even ought to be, is. Worshiping God is our primary responsibility in life. There is to be nothing, nothing that comes before the worship of God. And worship is not limited to singing songs in church or praying or reading our Bibles. When we talk about worship, it deals with our priorities and it deals with what do we place emphasis on and what do we put number one in our lives. So it deals with our priorities. We are called to be worshipers of God. And let me tell you this morning, nothing should come in the way of that. Not other people, not self. Tied in with this, number three, honoring God is more important than life itself. We certainly see this in the lives of these three Hebrew men. We see that Nebuchadnezzar's anger is fierce, his countenance is frightening, and the furnace is hot. And yet these three men chose to honor God instead of obeying the king and dishonoring God. And so the challenge for all of us as you go through your busy life, there will be countless decisions that you have to make every day. Decisions every day. Am I going to put God first? Am I going to honor God in this decision? Or am I going to just hope for the best and do things my way? Every day there will be things that come before you. And my challenge you is to put God first, and then God is going to take care of the rest. Number four, again, closely tied in with this, or connected, choose to fear God, not man. Choose the fear of God instead of the fear of man. The decisions that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made were based on the principle that Jesus reiterated some 600 years later. And that principle is this, Matthew chapter 10. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Taking God at his word is what faith is all about. And these men choose to fear God, to trust in God, not be worried about what man could do to them. Number five, know the character and the ability of our God. This harkens back to verse 17. God is able. God is always able. Do not ever lose sight of this in your life. What seems impossible from a human perspective is not impossible for God. It's simply a snap of the fingers for God to overcome seemingly insurmountable things. Whatever situation you might be facing, give it over to our God who is able. God is always able, always able to fix our situations. Finally, our last point for this morning is this. I want you to know that God is always with us even in the furnaces. Our God does not abandon us. Our God does not forsake us. Sometimes we feel like this when we are in the furnaces of life, when things in life get hot and they get difficult and we feel like we are just being burned on all sides. Know that God is there. He will not abandon His children ever. And furthermore, we need to understand that God often reveals himself to us even more when we are in the midst of those furnaces and struggles and sufferings of life. We discover that God is with us in very real and tangible ways. He is always there, always there. God has not abandoned you, and God will never abandon you either. As the praise team comes forward, just close with me in a final word of prayer. God, our Father, I'm grateful once again to be here this morning to unpack your word, to learn more about you and about your character. God, we are so thankful for the example that these Hebrew men set for us. I pray that when we encounter 
those decisions that we would keep our eyes always fixed towards you. I pray that we would choose you over anything that this world has to offer. God, help us to love you and faithfully serve you every day of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand, please.